Welcome to the daily objective. Apologies for the slight delay, technical problems from my side. Today we talk about history and we have Brandon Lisi with us. So I don't say uh, we didn't have time to prepare because of the technical problems. I'll tell you how I know Brandon. So I was in Ocon and I think it was in Charles Stock. At some point, there was something, a program that was being uh, promoted, something related to Ayn Rand University. And I see a guy on the screen who takes over the screen. He's very enthusiastic. He talks about the impact of air. You're like, okay, this guy, we need to find out who this guy is. And it's this guy here. <laughs> so Brandon, why don't you tell us a bit more about yourself? And then we're going to jump in on our discussion on uh, history and why we find it fascinating. Yeah, well, thank you so much for that kind introduction, Nikos. It was a pleasure getting to meet you in person for the first time at Ocon and to be here today. Um, so I'm Brandon Lisi. I'm the curator of the Sharon Historical Society here in Sharon, Connecticut. And I have uh, just a really passionate interest in American history and all the lessons that I think we can learn from it. So I, I think we have a very important topic today, using history to illustrate an abstract principle. Um, so just delighted to, to, to be here and to talk about it with, with you and uh, with our audience. Excellent. So we're gonna, there's gonna be two parts. The first part is the value we find in history. So it's easy to sell people why they should uh, you know, appreciate beautiful art. It makes your heart, uh, it's, it puts you in a different uh, world, which is more beautiful and all that stuff. It's easy to tell people why to embrace, let's say, fitness. So let's try to <laughs> sell them a little history. And I have three things in terms of selling history. The first thing is by knowing history, you don't be that guy who says stupid things. I mean, if you, if you participate in the discussion in the public sphere, knowing history gives you a comparative advantage. For example, when you hear people saying, when you hear conservatives saying, oh, Marxism is all around today with CRT, or political violence has never been that bad. It's like, when were you born? Have you read about the 60s and the 70s where there was <laughs> like one terrorist attack uh, every, every day? That's the one reason. The other reason, though, is that I find in history what other people find in art. You travel in a different world, sometimes a world which is larger than life. You meet personalities that are inspiring, even if they're bad people. I mean, you can learn from bad people. I'm reading a book these days about the history of radical Islam, and it's quite fascinating the zeal that these people had and how committed they were to changing society for the worse, but it was still interesting. And the second is history as being kind of this battlefield where you test ideas. So that would be my three. Exactly. So let's say we say capitalism is good. Okay, do we, can we see this in history? So this would be my three selling points of history. What would you say? What are your selling points? Well, I think this is communicated best by Leonard Peikoff in a lecture that he did called uh, Uniting History and Philosophy. And the, probably the most convinced that I've ever been about the importance of history is when he says, history is the great laboratory in the study of man, in, in the study of human beings. And so, you know, it, it's great that you're asking the question, why is this important? Why is it useful to talk about an issue like compromise and the importance of thinking in principles? And I hope what we can demonstrate today is that abstract moral principles are not just floating, disconnected and, and disconnected from reality, but they have a real impact on people's lives in the here and now. And history is our means of understanding those principles, seeing those principles put into action and actually being able to see the results. So if we want to understand the world that we live in and the sort of uh, struggles that we still face today in the political and philosophical realm, we have to study history. So that's why I, I like you said, it's easy to sell people on, on you know, physical fitness. And I think of studying history, it's a, it's a form of, uh, of mental fitness uh, to, to really train your mind to really think in terms of concretes and use those concretes to, to reach uh, you know, really powerful principles. Talking about concretes, let's concretize. So can you give us one example from any country's history or any historical incident where you think that it takes a principle which is an abstract philosophical principle and it concretizes and it tells you, look, this is how it works? In yeah, practice. well, I think. Yeah, I, I think the biggest example is, you know, and this is something I talked about with Amanda Maxim last week, is the founders of this country, of the United States of America, set forth these principles of individual rights. And what we see in the ensuing two centuries is this massive explosion of wealth 
and of productivity and of people's health and their lives and the things that their lives are able to do. And it's the, the 19th century is completely unprecedented. And what we should take away from this is that, you know, when people, you know, basically establish a rights based society, that all of us reap enormous benefits and that our lives become infinitely better. Um, so that's really the one that really comes to mind for me, simply because that's how I got really passionate about history, was understanding how that worked and sort of all of the implications of it and, and to explore some of the nuances and some of the controversial topics um, uh, surrounding what I just talked about. And that's uh, what I hope to do today. OK, so let me play here a bit devil's advocate. So mm -hmm. a devil's advocate would say that history actually proves that principles don't really matter and that history is an example of one compromise after the other. Let me give mm. three examples, and I, I'm interested in your refutation. So the first one would be, uh, take, for example, the Civil War. When the Civil War ends, what does the North do? They go to General Lee, and they don't punish him. They don't, uh, what they say, they, they're like, look, you will surrender. We're going to treat you like the gentleman you are. And let's go on with our lives. So, so, so someone would say, wait, but what about uh, the, the issue of uh, justice and he should pay, he should end up in prison. But someone would say, look, we did the right pragmatic thing because this made sure that there would be peace, that uh, Lee wouldn't start, let's say, a guerrilla warfare. And therefore, by putting aside, let's say, principles, we made sure that things were better. Let me give you a second example. And uh, I, another example would be, let's say, how this Cold War ended. So what did we do to end the Cold War? The pragmatists would say, we went to Gorbachev and we smooched a bit with him. We became friends. We said, look, you're a good guy. Tear down this wall. And through this, let's say, attack of friendship on the one hand, and on the other hand, it was, of course, the the this uh, race of uh, this arm race that depleted the Soviet economy, but by this attack of friendship of Reagan to Gorbachev, in a way, this made easier the collapse of Soviet Union. So through someone would say diplomacy or back channels, but something that doesn't doesn't sound like this. Oh, uh, moral righteousness says that we should condemn this guy. The Cold War ended, and everyone was uh, happier ever after. What would be your reply to this idea that history teaches us that pragmatism is the way to go? <laughs> yeah, well, you see this sentiment echoed throughout American politics to the present day that, you know, the only way to get things, big things done in a democracy is to is to have consensus and compromise. That's a quote from from Joe Biden uh, back in October. October. Um, and so the the one sort of essay that I would really recommend for this is in The Virtue of Selfishness by Ayn Rand. It's called Doesn't Life Require Compromise? And, and so I think what this really demonstrates is that you can only have a, a compromise if there's actual like shared values, if there's something to gain. So the example I always like to use is, you know, you have the interests of big states and large states in the United States after the American Revolution. Roger Sherman comes in in 1787 and helps organize a compromise so that we have the House of Representatives and we have the U.S. Senate. And that's something where both sides have something to gain from one another in terms of shared values. But when good compromises with evil, it's only evil can win. And I think this, this requires some elaboration. And I'll get to the, the two examples that you gave. Sure. Um, the, the power of good comes from its consistency. So when the good is consistent in its principles, evil is completely impotent. The only way that, uh, that evil can win is if the good abandons or compromises its principles when victims sanction their own destruction. So if, if the good, if, if people with the right ideas want to own the moral high ground, you have to stand by your principles consistency, consistently and not allow even the smallest compromise. So in the examples that you gave, you know, okay, so how, how to treat, you know, uh, the leaders of the American or, or the Confederate States of America after the Civil War, like what was the appropriate thing? Uh, as we'll you know talk about today, after 1876, because of a very contentious presidential election, we essentially uh, the United States ended Reconstruction and enabled all of these Confederate leaders to come back into power. 
And, you know, the thought was, well, we have to be conciliatory. We have to, you know, sort of resolve this presidential election. The expediency of the moment requires that we do this. And, and people think that that's a way of solving problems. But in fact, it actually has a huge consequence on people's lives. And in this case, the consequence was we had another hundred years of Jim Crow sort of style sort of society where there was segregation, extrajudicial lynchings, all kinds of things that were extremely destructive. And this has real impact on sort of black Americans post the Civil War. So to give a concrete example of, of the damage that this does. So between um, uh, in the immediate aftermath of the of the Civil War, you had 14 black congressmen elected to the House of Representatives, in addition to two black senators. And of that group of 16 I just mentioned, nine of them were born into slavery. But this was not the beginning of a new era for you know black Americans, because in fact, after uh, uh, after one of these senators left office in 1881, another black senator was not elected until 1967. And I just I, I say all this just to illustrate the point that ultimately by giving back the sort of, uh, you know, the leadership and not uh, punishing the Confederate leaders or at least keeping them out of power by not doing that, by compromising, we ultimately condemn uh, people living in that region to another hundred years of oppression until at least we get to the civil rights movement. And, and we can see how to this day, issues of individual rights being applied consistently continue to be compromised on and evil continues to win. Um, now, the other example you gave was the end of the Soviet Union. I would say in that case, the United States had everything to gain from seeing the Soviet Union collapse. But I think that in the end, what you can see, especially now with the issues we're now having with Putin, is that we were just foolishly over generous in our policy with the with the Soviet Union, ultimately, because, you know, this is how Russia uh, becomes, you know, a far more powerful nation is thinking of Russia as an ally you know, sitting at the table with them in organizations like the United Nations, giving them a seat on the UN Security Council. This is giving them a sanction and a sort of moral sort of standing um, that they don't deserve. Um, so if we're upset about the sorts of issues that we're now facing with someone like Vladimir Putin, it's in part because we've actually given this this monster um, a, a sort of a seat at the table with the good. And, uh, you know, we can't expect the, the consequence of that to be anything but destruction and uh, for, for people's lives and for their freedom. And what happens quite often, and it, because there is no principle in a country strategy or something else, you find yourself in a situation where no good solution is possible. Let's say you have you had a destructive non-policy in the Middle East, and at some point you find the Islamic State fighting Al-Qaeda. And somehow between the two, Al-Qaeda is the lesser evil. But the reason why you find yourself having to, to make this horrendous distinction, okay, well, do I prefer that Al-Qaeda wins or the Islamic State wins, is because you haven't got any principles all these years. So the person says, okay, now we need to compromise and back Al-Qaeda vis-a-vis the Islamic State, doesn't realize that, yeah, maybe if you find yourself in this horrendous situation, maybe this is the less destructive choice, but you found yourself in this situation because all these years you believed there are no principles and we should back today someone who is a bad guy tomorrow somewhere else because this is what quote uh, strategy and uh, diplomacy diplomacy request. I have more questions for you, but let's see what's happening in the chat. Many thanks to Marilyn. Great. She says, wasn't Andrew Johnson racist, envious and inept? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, so the, the thing about Andrew Johnson, I mean, this is also I mean, this is a good example of compromise um, uh, on Lincoln's part, who I think uh, it, hopefully we have a chance today uh, to talk a little bit about, you know, the ways in which, you know, he's, he is thinking in principle and, and the debt that we owe someone like Lincoln. But he certainly wait, not, tell us before yeah. uh, the context, who is Andrew Johnson? Where is he oh, Andrew oh, yes, yes. I, yeah. I, so so Andrew Johnson was the only uh, I believe, senator from the one of the southern seceding states that remained with the union. So he was a senator from Tennessee, but decides he's not going to, even though Tennessee is a seceding state, he's going to stick around. And he was the only one to do so. So um, in, in this case, in, in 1864, when there was a sort of serious issue about do we continue the war? This is really bloody. There was not really a lot of enthusiasm about continuing the war in the north. 
Um, and, and there are a lot of people who thought, why are we, you know, why are Americans sort of like, you know, killing each other? Um, uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln chooses Andrew Johnson as his running mate in the 1864 election, which even though uh, Andrew Johnson and Lincoln did not agree on a lot of things, they basically agreed that the war had to continue and that the Confederacy needed to be put down. And they actually, even though they were from other political parties, Andrew Johnson was a Democrat, Lincoln was a Republican, they merged into a single ticket that year in 1864 called the National Union Party. And then, of course, after Lincoln is assassinated um, uh, in, in 1865, Johnson comes to power and immediately tries to stop the sorts of, you know, uh, like, you know, the passage of the you know, 13th, 14th and 15th amendments, um, which basically, you know, give rights to formerly enslaved peoples. Um, Johnson tries to stand in the way of that. Now, thankfully, um, by that point, we had a Congress that was firmly committed to the idea of of applying these principles and and making sure that the Confederacy accepted the sort of the the amendments that were passed down from the federal government. Um, and so they rendered him completely pow powerless. He was almost removed from office. Um, but uh, he's he's somebody that I think um, goes down quite unfavorably in American history because he really stood in the way of progress in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War. But that's nothing compared to the kinds of compromises that we would make uh, after 1876. So what this should demonstrate is, is that, uh, you know, when you bring someone into power like that in the name of political expediency, trying to win a presidential election, that ultimately can have grave consequences because, you know, someone who's in the vice presidential seat is just one step away from from presidential uh, authority. Right. So you mentioned the uh, Lincoln, and I think it would be uh, mm. whenever it's, I don't know, his birthday or the anniversary of his death, we should do a whole episode on Lincoln. Particularly Absolutely. because people who are around the freedom movement or they get uh, introduced to libertarianism, there are many libertarians who have such a bad view of Lincoln. And you wonder, is this because there's some sympathy to the lost cause or whatever, which, let's face it, is present, to put it mildly, among libertarian circles? Or is it true that Lincoln was uh, unprincipled? So, for example, they say, look, he clearly didn't care about slavery. He didn't mention it in his inaugural address. He just wanted to save the union and all that stuff. So we do, we do need to, we need to discuss Lincoln on a whole new yeah. episode. Thank you, Kathleen, for your super chat. So here's a question. So let's say, Brandon, that someone has zero idea of American history except from the very base, like something happened in 4th of July, there was a war of independence, then it was a civil war. So would you recommend some books mm. that don't only present the history, but two things. One, also interesting to read because there are good history books that are boring and unreadable. So the <laughs> first thing, it's readable by someone who is not a professional historian, but also second, who have some understanding of what you explained as uh, the importance of principles and kind of understanding what are the what is the way that history unfolds and what makes the world go round. So that would, for example, take away, keep away Marxist interpretations of history, which just focus on productive relations and all that stuff. Yeah, well, there's certainly a lot of books, and I, I'll, I'll I'll mention them. A lot of books that I can recommend that focus in on specific issues or are very good for advanced readers. The unfortunate thing is that there is a serious lack, and I think a, a very desperate need for a book that actually gives you a survey of American history, sort of an integrated long form view that applies the sorts of principles that we're talking about. Um, and I can say that unfortunately that book does not exist yet, but it is something I am working on actively and hope to have it within the next two years. So I, I, I can't sure. make too many promises, but it is like the culmination of my life's work to see that book created. Now, what I can tell you is, is that if you just want a really good place to start now, I, like I said, um, most lectures, books that I think are really worth reading, they focus in on specific issues. That, and even though we don't have that, the full survey book yet, the fully integrated view, there are some places that you can start. So from, from mainstream sort of sources, one of the great lecture series I would recommend, it's a series on the American Revolution, and it's actually comes out of Yale University, surprisingly not, but, but Joanne Freeman's lecture on the American Revolution, I don't think it's perfect by any means. Um, there 
there are some things I would quibble with here and there about what she's including and not including, but she's super energetic, will really, I think, convince you the value of studying history. And that for me was like one of my favorite lectures growing up as I was, you know, doing all of my uh, sort of research and, you know, getting into grad school and everything. Um, I, I loved that series. And then Wait, if, if you uh, yeah, repeat us the name, please. And Daniel, is, uh, you can put it on the description. Again, this is not an endorsement by any of us. Yeah. It's just that a suggestion that it's uh, that it's it would be good to say. So could you repeat the name and the title yes. of the series? Yes. So the lecturer is Joanne Freeman of Yale. And the lecture series is called The American Revolution. And, and the reason why I recommend that one is that that kind of gives you like a good foundation, right? She takes you through the colonial period, what it was like to be a British American, takes you through the American Revolution. I, I, I think it was really engaging. And, and a part of it is, it's like you said, Nikos, um, you know, you want someone who's interesting. And she's very interesting, very energetic, and really brings a lot of passion to the subject. Now, Excellent. if uh, when after you listen to that, um, the one thing I will recommend is, and this is good, I think, for advanced readers. Readers, but maybe not as an introductory work is uh, America's Revolutionary Mind by C. Bradley Thompson. This this gives you a lot of really great concretes about what the founders were thinking, and, and especially if you're interested about the slavery issue, his fifth chapter on equality and slavery is really really valuable. Um, I, I don't think you can just read it in isolation. You probably have to read the whole book to really get uh, like the full value. But that chapter alone will I think resolves a lot of the really controversial debates and discussions that we have. In our political discourse and it will give you a lot of clarity is is it but but i don't recommend as an introductory work because i think it's good to know here is the course of like what happened um and uh, uh oh, see bradley it, johnson it, it, yeah. the america's revolution mind so yes uh, that, and he's someone who is uh, around the objectivist universe so he also i haven't read the book but i guess he ticks also the box that it's a principled approach and understands how history uh, unfolds any other yeah, suggestions? Um, yeah, um, yeah, no, I, I, I will say that, um, you know, for people who want a view of history that goes beyond just, let's say, um, uh, American history, but you want like a bigger sort of broader perspective, which, um, you know, knowledge is a unity, which means you really have to keep a whole context in, in view when you're studying history. So a great book, I think, to that end is uh, written by the late John David Lewis. It's called Nothing Less Than Victory. Now, he has a particular purpose. He's trying to communicate why you should have a principled foreign policy and why the good should pursue victory. But he gives you a lot of really great examples and covers a, an amazing amount of history in a short amount of time, um, you know, going over Greek. Greek history, Roman history, um, the American Civil War, World War II, um, and 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 he is a a really great writer. Um, the, the the three books that he's left to us um, are uh, it's one one book called Solon the Thinker, another one called Early Greek Lawgivers. This is like just really great to have because I think in order to understand American history, you really have to understand what was like life before what was life like before the Enlightenment, before the Industrial Revolution. Uh, you know, and that's why you know for my purposes, even though I'm an American historian, it, it is immensely important for all people who are interested in history, get the context, you know, understand what was life like in the Middle Ages, because you now have, I just read an article in Reuters the other day saying, like, did you know that medieval peasants had more uh, vacation time than you did? And I guess the implication being that, like, you know, your your life is actually terrible and medieval peasants didn't really have it so bad. So it's like it, you can succumb to that kind of thinking if you don't have the full concept of history and, and know historical facts. Um, and and. So so th this is what I mean when I we said at the top of the show, studying history is a form of mental fitness. You know, you have to, you know, have these concretes um, to sort of see through, you know, a lot of the narratives that get thrown out there. And that's why I said that my first selling point of why study history is don't be that guy who has this stupid hot take. So actually, <laughs> when I was reading Derder McCloskey uh, on uh, probably one of the books of the trilogy, which I keep forgetting the names, I think. Anyway, the, she talks about the medieval times and she was telling that in some ways, French farmers had to probably something like close to hibernate. So they would, uh, they would uh, hug each other and be in a state during the day of being something between half asleep and awake. And the reason was not to expand energy. So life was so bad and there was such... Uh, such, such a shortage of food and heat that you would try to do anything by so as not to spend 
the precious energy you have. And this is the beautiful past that uh, today we see people you know, embrace, uh, reject modernity, embrace the tradition, which is a fun meme till you actually read the history about what, uh, what, tradition, what tradition was, uh, was, uh, was like. Uh, Marlene, thank you very much for your super chat. Says thank you for putting Andrew Johnson in perspective. Uh, so uh, let me tell you this. Brandon, is it true that you can also continue the discussion in Clubhouse? Oh, I sure can. And I'd be delighted to. So I, okay. I know you may not be able to join us, Nikos, but but yes, what I'll say is, is that uh, like like last time I was on with Amanda, we've only really scratched the surface of what we can talk about. Um, and, and I love the idea of doing a full show on on Lincoln on I think what is his birthday, February 2nd, February 12th. What is that? I know, I know uh, President Day is like halfway between him and Washington. <laughs> okay, we're going to find an excuse to have a Lincoln episode earlier. We, we might okay. find when his, the Lincoln Memorial was erected. We're going to find an anniversary to find an excuse to have the episode. Yeah, got it. So, and one last, one last question before you go to, I can't follow in Clubhouse. Quite right. Oh, here's another superstar. Thank you, Marlene. Did you know that medieval peasants didn't have indoor plumbing? Well, let me tell you something about how life was, not in the medieval times, but in early industrial revolution times. So not only there was no inter, inter plumbing, I remember I was in Edinburgh and there was this uh, city tour and the tour guide was a cool guy. And he told us, he says, look, I want to put you in the atmosphere of what it meant to live in that times. And he said, if I would put you today, the 21st century, man or woman in a time capsule as you are today and i would release you in the industrial revolution the early industrial revolution edinburgh the first thing that would happen to you is you would immediately faint because you wouldn't be used to the smell why the smell a because people were living in the same indoor spaces with animals and all that stuff but also because there was no, not only there was no plumbing but also there was no uh, how do you call where the thing goes from the toilet uh, uh, I've got the Greek term in my in my in my mind. <laughs> you know the system that go you go to the toilet and the thing goes to anyway. Like it, it, it filters away from your drinking water is the main thing, right? You know, like yes. Yeah. So and their system was separate. yeah. People would poo or whatever they would do, and then they would go out and they would shout, "Step aside!" and they would throw it on the ground. And from the ground, there were some canals that would bring it down to a river, which was probably a river where people would also bath there and all that stuff. Right. Anyway, not your ideal uh, hygiene. So not only there was no indoor plumbing, but the conditions in life would be completely unimaginable today. And the Marxist sees that and says, oh, this is what the Industrial Revolution did. But the actual thing is, this is what the Industrial Revolution ended. This is what the Industrial Revolution put an end Two. Uh, one more question. Hi, uh, we, you have a super chat from Enric. Thank you very much, Enric. So Enric says, on slavery, there's the argument, American slavery is far worse due to the idea of property. Satel slavery. Is there a response? So because, so the idea is you, you combine the idea of private property with the idea of slavery, and now your slave is not this person who you know, is part of the house, so you have some responsibility vis-a-vis -vis them or whatever the idealized the view of slavery is. But this is now the slave is a, is a, your property and you, you do horrible things to him and whatever. So what's your take on this? Uh, yeah, well, that's a really great question. Uh, the one thing I will say is, is that it's a damn good thing that we reached a point where we like have an idea of like what it means to have rights in the first place. And that is a huge achievement that that's the only way that we could have ended slavery is with that concept of rights, including property rights. Um, and, and as I mentioned in the discussion with Amanda, when you see the accounts of enslaved peoples, like I mentioned Elizabeth Freeman, I mentioned Frederick Douglass, who when they, they read the Declaration of Independence for the first time, this means that like slavery is on the way out and I have a strong moral stance to take against slavery. So yes, I mean, in, if you're going to say strictly in terms of scale, yes, I mean, the Atlantic slave trade post the discovery of the Americas was unprecedented in the number of people. I think it was like something like 12 million uh, slaves crossed 
the Atlantic. And, and if by comparison, take like ancient Egypt, right? At the time when the pyramids were built, the world population was only like 20 million, right? So it's like almost almost like half the size of the total population back in the day, right? We're across the Atlantic after the, so so yes, on a, on a, on a sheer scale, I mean, it, it, it's monstrous in, in that regard and the number of people that died. Um, but but the fact that we had property rights meant that we meant that we had an actual argument against slavery. And, and so this notion of sort of linking capitalism with slavery, it's the worst kind of anti concept because you're essentially obliterating the actual thing that ends slavery in, in all of its forms. Now, certainly chattel slavery is the worst. But what about like, you know, arguments, you know, against like a military draft or the kinds of like rights that we need, you know, in terms of economic and political freedom? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, everybody is a slave in a society where a king rules and it's all delegated to to these sort of like lords or whatever, who basically can decide like what what happens with the people under them. Right. Um, that that that's a slave society is in, in every sense of the word. And the, the interesting thing is that even Marx himself got that slavery and capitalism are incompatible. He makes it clear in volume one of Capital, but the leftists are too busy to even read the. Uh, to read Marx himself, uh, Robert says, running water and sewer system, grossly underrated. Yeah, sewer system. Did you say Rotterdam? So no, no, it says running water and, su and sewer oh, system. Oh, running water. Grossly I got you. underrated. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, there's something about the Rotterdam sewer system I don't know about. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> okay. So, I, so uh, Brandon and Daniel will be on Clubhouse. Brandon, tell us a bit more where people can follow, uh, can follow you, can see parts of your work till that uh, book that you said come out. Where can oh, yeah. people keep in touch with you? Yeah, keep in touch with me on my website, brandonlisi.com. Um, also, my employer's website, sharonhist.org. Um, that's the Sharon Historical Society in Sharon, Connecticut. They have a lot of my written works on there, and you know they're kind enough to to help. Uh, you know, uh, you know, using them as a platform for a lot of the things I'm doing. So please do uh, check out you know all of our content, and um, I hope to see many of you in Clubhouse and talk a little bit more about history. So please do bring your questions, bring all the questions that you've always wanted to ask about history that you felt feel like you need clarity on and i'm just delighted to stick around and, and answer them all excellent and daniel if we can put uh, on the link of the episode the uh, uh, brandon's site and also the parts of his institution site where he posts his articles that would be great thank you uh, thank you marilyn one more super says anti-slaver political writings 8033 mm. till 8060 edited by brad thompson Okay, yes. I didn't know about this uh, book. book. So, anti-slavery on... political writings, 1833 till 1860, by edited by Brad Thompson. Upcoming 9 p.m. UK time, we've got HBTV with Harry Binswager, and today is part three: Objectivism versus Academic Philosophy. So, why is Ayn Rand an outsider in academia, and what's and why this is to be predicted? Predi that this is unpredictable if you understand Rand and if you understand academia. Okay, so thank you very much, Brandon. And thanks to our viewers, to our super chatters. Again, read history. It's fascinating. It can be as fascinating as reading a novel. Uh, yes, you can. And it's, in, in some ways, it's, it's an art. Good history is a form of uh, art, not by definition. Don't tell me that's not what the romantic man is. Anyway, that's how I see it as an enjoyer of history. Thanks, Brandon. And thanks, thanks Nikos. Bye-bye. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs>